Welcome you all. I think it's time to start. My name is Rakesh from Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Uh, as you all know, we are organizing this seminar series in bioinformatics and computational biology. We are grateful to the provost office who initiated this project last year to establish a center of research excellence in bioinformatics called ICREST, Inter Interdisciplinary Center for Research Excellence in Science and Technology. So we are focusing on bioinformatics and computational biology. There are other bioinformatics groups here, so the idea is we all come together. So I think there are lots, lots of students here. Uh, Dr. Peter White, who is the director of bioinformatics certificate program. So I think this is a good venue to announce that please join uh, more students in this program because bioinformatics is growing in this area. So we have been organizing this seminar series, and this is the most prominent part one because this is a CERNI lecture which is a distinguished series, and we, Dr. Melcher will soon tell about the history of Robert J. Cerny. And I would also like to welcome all the connecting institutes we have video conferencing right now. Uh, thanks to Elaine and her staff to work on this. Uh, the Nobel Foundation is connected, and the uh, University of Oklahoma, I don't know, but uh, College of Health Sciences in Tulsa, then uh, OSU Health Sciences in Tulsa, Tulsa Community College, University of Tulsa, they're all connected through uh, this conference. They are all listening. And maybe after that, they will have some uh, question answers too. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Ulrich Melcher, uh, who is the endowed professor for Robert J. Cerny. And he's a regent professor in biochemistry. He will tell us about the Cerny, what is his history, how it started. And then he will introduce our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Eugene Koonin from NCBI. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Sorry that you have to put up with some commercial messages, but uh, there will be no commercial interruptions once the lecture gets started. Uh, this, the sponsorship by the Robert J. Cerny Foundation uh, professorship is a result of a donation by John and Heidi Niblack to the OSU Foundation. Uh, John was a 1960 OSU graduate. He uh, worked and studied under Cerny first at a Tulsa High School student in a summer job program here at OSU, then as an OSU chemistry major. And upon graduation, he thought about becoming a university pro uh, professor like his mentor, but he decided instead to join Pfizer Chemical Company in 1967 and started a career that would help him set direct research and directions and create drugs used to battle viral illnesses, cancer, and autoimmune disorders. So with that, we thank him and uh, we honor Robert J. Cerny as a result of that. It's my job now to introduce to you Eugene Koonin, who I've known for over 21 years when he was last here in uh, Stillwater. He uh, is a native of the former Soviet Union. He's a diplomat and PhD from uh, Moscow State University in virology. In the USSR, he became a research scientist at the USSR Academies of Medical Science and then of Sciences, moving on to be chief of the uh, Gene Systematics and Bacterial Evolution Division. In 1991, he was a visiting uh, scientist at Texas A&M University. During that time, he paid us a visit here. And then he became a visiting scientist at NCBI and then eventually uh, become a full senior investigator there in 1996. He's an adjunct at Boston University and Georgia Tech University. He is well known for his power to think about sequences and figure out how things have evolved be based on the sequences and many other things related to bioinformatics. It's been a great pleasure to know him and it's a great pleasure to introduce him. Welcome, Eugene. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ulrich. It's a pleasure to be here again after all these years. Um, so it is perhaps appropriate now, given all this history, to go back to my first love, so to speak, in science uh, and uh, discuss with you uh, the evolution of viruses that I would like to coach in terms of the expanding uh, virus code. And of course, I have to apologize for the words down there. I gave, um, I did speak on this subject in Israel rather recently. It was a previous version 
or of this lecture, hopefully I'm giving you something a little better today. But of course, it, it re please really read Stillwater, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So without much further ado, actually with quite a bit of ado, I'm sorry. Oh, mm, because what, I'm, what, what, what I want to bring your attention to is the uh, cru crucial importance and the dominance, the real dominance of viruses on this planet and in the very least in the uh, biosphere or of this <coughs> planet. Indeed, in the last seven or eight years, uh, it has become abundantly clear that you know, viruses are the most common biological entities on this planet. Just think about that. It's been shown that one cubic centimeter, one milliliter of seawater typically contains between a million and a billion virus particles. And I don't, from, from the preliminary data that's available, I don't see, um, think that, um, let's say, soil, all the contents of our intestine are, are, are significantly less rich uh, in viruses. And it has been shown that there are millions, really millions, and there is no good estimate of the total count of diverse bacteriophage species, let alone or, you know, viruses of other or organisms in water, soil, and gut. Mm, so viruses are indeed the most abundant biological entities in the biosphere with oh, one to two and even to three orders of magnitude more of virus particles than than uh, physical cells. Oh, even more important than that, it is, it is very clear now that the pan genomes of viruses and cellular organisms are in the very least comparable in terms of their complexity. In all likelihood, actually, the, ge the, the true genetic complexity of viruses is greater uh, uh, than the genetic complexity of all cellular organisms uh, taken together. So viruses are really really dominate uh, mm, uh, the biosphere. So to speak, we live in a virus world. Also, I'm just reminding you what is uh, rather known from textbooks, but I think it's important to emphasize, uh, in particular um, in the light of this dominance of viruses in the biosphere, um, that uh, viruses are very much unlike cellular life forms, uh, show Mm, uh, the remarkable diversity of um, genetic cycles. Mm, basically, speaking somewhat metaphorically, we can say that uh, viruses are the, uh, represent the biosphere's laboratory of mm, genomic strategies. So wait, uh, no. uh, we have um, no, numerous, um, we have identified thousands of viruses, positive strand RNA genomes, in a sense, the simplest genomic strategy imaginable, uh, whereby a virus encapsulates the same RNA that is used uh, for protein production, the mRNA. Uh, there are also uh, somewhat less diversity, but still considerable diversity of double-strand double RNA viruses, both that encapsulate RNA double uh, helix, uh, and negative-strand RNA viruses, uh, those uh, that encapsulate the complementary strand of RNA and accordingly have to uh, package all the enzymes in, in, the, in the virion. Um, and, and there is, of course, a whole uh, vast class of retrotranscribing genetic element uh, that uh, includes both RNA viruses and DNA viruses that are brought together uh, by the fact uh, that they are all using a homologous reverse transcriptase uh, to make DNA and an RNA plate at some stage or, um, of the replication cycle. And then we have, of course, all kinds of DNA viruses, starting with very small single-stranded DNA viruses that have been shown to be related to plasmids um, and, uh, and proceeding to the uh, um, probably on the whole the vastest um, virus class, the double-stranded RNA um, viruses which had the same genetic cycle as cellular life forms. So you are somewhere uh, uh, there, uh, but viruses are all over uh, the space of 
possible um, you know, genetic strategies. Uh, so, consider this, uh, the, uh, this discussion an inter introduction to the main subject of my talk today, because the main subject is to show you some new discoveries made by uh, methods of uh, genomics and metagenomics, but I want to make this um, general introduction to impress on you the huge evolutionary role that I think uh, viruses play uh, in the evolution of life. So very briefly, uh, we'll, uh, I want to um, uh, introduce the notion of, uh, speak of the natural history of viral genes and introduce the notion of viral hallmark genes. So what are these hallmark genes? This is really um, a realization to which I have come uh, something like five or six years ago, um, and it does not stop to startle me. Uh, namely that all these diverse, um, no, extremely diverse groups of viruses that employ all these extremely diverse genomic strategies that we just um, had a chance to uh, review on the previous slide. Um, a very large subsets of these viruses pair homologous genes. So these whole, uh, these Umar genes, it has, in a certain sense, the signatures of the viral state are those that are shared uh, by many diverse groups of viruses, from the smallest RNA viruses to the giant DNA viruses, which we will discuss in greater um, uh, detail in a few moments. Uh, moreover, um, importantly, these are really viral signatures. There are only distant homologs in cellular organisms, and there is good support for the common origin of all the viral members of the respective uh, gene families. These are bi um, uh, genes that are essential for viral replication. Their products play a major role in genome replication, packaging, and assembly. So these are signatures of the viral state. What are they? Well, there aren't that many, and they are extremely widespread among viruses. These are the so-called general capsid proteins uh, uh, that uh, uh, comprise the basis of the most common ecocidal viral uh, particles. These are the so-called superfamily three RNA helicases that are found in a huge diversity of viral genomes and genomes of related plasmids, but not in uh, genomes of cellular life forms that are uh, key to the replication of viral genomes, both RNA and DNA. These are then RNA-dependent RNA polymerases and reverse transcriptases. Again, enzymes that we find in abundance uh, mm, uh, within uh, mm, genomes of cellular life forms. But whenever one looks carefully, there mm, is the traceable origin of, you know, of these reverse, uh, reverse transcriptases and reverse transcribed elements from mm, a selfish element, from a virus or virus-like element. These are endonucleases. Uh, uh, that are involved in the initiation of rolling circle uh, DNA uh, replications of uh, no, viral type of primases and other viruses. Not many, on the order of a couple dozen altogether, these uh, hallmark proteins that, however, permeate the virus world and separate it from the world, world of cellular life forms. So if we um, do a rough, but not too imprecise, break down um, uh, genes in viruses of different classes, we'll see that in sm <coughs> viruses with small genomes, such as most RNA viruses, retro elements, and rolling circle replicons, um, actually the majority of the genetic capacity of the virus genome is dedicated um, to encoding uh, these hallmark prot uh, uh, proteins. And, but then, uh, then we mm, proceed from these smallest viruses to the genomes of vi intermediate size vi or, mm, viral or genomes of several dozen KB, and then to large or, mm, viral genomes. Or, mm, the, the hallmark genes or, become a small conserved core of these genomes, whereas the rest of the or, mm, genes have very different evolutionary fates and or, largely have been accumulated, acquired at different stages of evolution from different hosts and other viruses. Uh, so I would like to put forward my, my favorite evolutionary hypothesis, if you will, 
which starts from the premises that viral hallmark genes are present in a huge diversity of viruses and other selfish elements and are represented only by a remote homologs in cellular life form. So mm, uh, basically the idea here um, is that since they, uh, uh, these genes are concerned in so many viruses and are so distinct from the cellular, um, you know, from what we see in cellular life form, this is how this has been from the very beginning. In other words, the hallmark genes and by implications the major lineages of modern viruses, at least uh, when we speak of viruses of areas, descend directly from a primordial gene pool. Of course, um, here there is, I believe, an excellent synergy, the, the diversity of genomic strategies that we briefly uh, discussed. Uh, it stands to reason that mm, this, uh, uh, some of these genomic strategies come directly from the primordial RNA world and others have been mm, evolving sim mm, uh, concomitantly or uh, until the fixation of the single genomic strategy that is characteristic of cellular life form. A key corollary then is that if viruses come directly from a primordial gene pool, then origin of viruses is inextricably linked to the origin of cells. So it's time now uh, mm, to briefly uh, mm, discuss the competing concepts of the origin of viruses that you can find in the literature. Um, basically, there are three mm, uh, types of these mm, of, of scenarios uh, mm, for the uh, evolution of viruses. And one of these is the cell degeneration idea, uh, which is historically the first, and that, that came out of vogue for a long time. But I think it's coming, is making some sort of a comeback, and we'll come to that um, very shortly. The idea here is very simple, and you can, uh, by the way, spoke, you already grasp it from this part of the slide. I apologize that due, due to this design, I cannot point <laughs> to the slides, but I think you can, you can discern stuff. Um, so basically, uh, the idea is that you start with a cell, the bona fide, or, you know, let's say, bacterial cell, and then it degenerates into a small parasitic cell. So this will, this will help me manipulate this. Uh, am I really? Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no. Let's, go, let's go back to this. Uh, mm, so pro, from a full-fledged, or let's say bacterial cell, there is degeneration to a small parasitic cell, such as, for instance, intracellular parasites, Chlamydia ericaceae, and the like. Then from there to mm, uh, the very small, really small, uh, mm, uh, virus. Mm. For a variety of reasons, for the lack of the transitional forms, for the mm, uh, lack of the translation system in viruses, for a variety <coughs> of reasons, uh, mm, I uh, believe, and we'll come back to that for a second, I believe, that this is really not a realistic possibility. Now, escape genes, the second, um, mm, historically perhaps the second uh, mm, hypothesis on the origin of viruses postulates that uh, mm, viruses evolve perhaps through a plasmid stage from bona fide uh, mm, cellular genes sort of gone on a rampage or uh, mm, becoming uh, selfish replicons. This is a this is an interesting idea. Uh, the problem with that is that we really uh, mm, do not see uh, the ancestors, the progenitors of viral hallmark genes in cellular genome, which makes this scenario rather baseless as the mainstream of virus evolution. So by exclusion, I tend to uh, believe uh, mm, that the only realistic scenario for the origin of viruses for the origin of the first viruses, is from the primordial mm, gene pool, pool, from free cellular life forms, as I already alluded. <coughs> um, so this is a, a schematic uh, from a, sort of a big picture mm, of, the or, of the origin of cells uh, that we published some years ago with my colleague uh, mm, uh, Bill Martin. And basically, I, I, will, uh, I don't have the opportunity to go into the interesting uh, mm, uh, biochemical, uh, geochemical, chemical details here. Um, that would be another, another lecture. 
But just in brief, uh, this scenario postulate that, postulates that the, RNA, the primordial RNA uh, world um, evolved in a certain type of inorganic compartments, not, not in cells, but in organic compartments that you actually find on today's Earth at, or, um, at various kinds of hydrothermal springs and vents, except there is no such evolution there these days for understandable reasons because the niches are filled. Uh, and, this, uh, and this is the kind of environment that uh, this primordial virus-like world evolved at some relatively late stage in its evolution, at least in terms of the evolution of basic genetic mechanisms, giving rise to the two um, basic cellular types observed on Earth, archaea and bacteria. So basically, this is the picture of the ancient virus world that I want to impress on you. We now realize, this is not speculation, this, this is a plain fact, that viruses and virus-like genetic elements are not just pathogens that are important for diseases that they dominant entities in the biosphere. It has to be noted that theoretically, emergence of virus-like parasites is inevitable in any replicator system. That can be shown quite rigorously in mathematical models of um, evolution. So viruses have been developed from the very beginning of replication. So in the precellular era, mm, it seems likely that the genetic elements that later became viral and cellular genomes existed as a single pool in which we mixed, etched, recombined, and as we should see, uh, and evolved new increasingly complex gene ensembles. In that primordial genetic pool, most likely different replication strategies have already evolved and uh, mm, coexisted. However, with the emergence of the first prokaryotic cell, a distinct pool of viral genes formed that retained its identity ever since as evidence from the mm, expanded distribution of viral hallmark genes. Finally, I would note briefly that the We'll also have a chance to come back to that, that the emergence of the eukaryotic cell was sort of a second melting pot of virus evolution. And of course, it's important to remember that viruses make essential contributions to, to the evolution of the genomes of cellular life forms in, very, in many different ways. Uh, so, quote uh, mm, uh, these papers uh, mm, uh, that appeared a couple of years ago Nature Reviews Microbiology, the first by David Moreira and Fury uh, Lopez Garcia, that aims that viruses basically, to cut a somewhat long thing short, are not alive and should be excluded uh, from the uh, tree of life. Uh, in other words, unimportant for the evolution of true or cellular organisms. So in our rebuttal we say, Oh, mm, uh, this time I think Kevich and Valeria and Dole. In our rebuttal, they say uh, that uh, mm, uh, the virus world seems to provide a much needed window into the key early stages of this process. The problem of cell, um, uh, that is, uh, evolution of life and in particular mm, cellular uh, mm, uh, life. Uh, it would be a great pity not to use that opportunity to look into the Mm, uh, earliest stages of life evolution. All right. So we shall talk about uh, now, coming from the general subjects, we will talk about very concrete and very specific mm, and touch upon these, vi these viruses that have recently become mm, uh, the famous. So these are the, so far at least, largest, most complex viruses so-called nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses of mm, uh, eukaryotes. And in particular, the, um, uh, oh, the remarkable giant viruses, of which the mini virus shown here is the prototype. So it is shown here back-to-back mm, -back with a bacterium. It's a parasite granted, uh, mm, but a bona fide bacterium. And you see uh, that the particles of the, the, the viral particle and the bacterial cell are very similar 
in dimensions and in size, of differences in shape, or mm, quite or obviously, or, but or generally they are sort of very, 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 very similar in uh, appearance. As a matter of fact, the mini virus was first, first I isolated by the old and coworkers in Marseille. Then they were, were uh, then they were looking into rickettsia-like, the novel rickettsia-like parasites in. They were looking for a uh, new rickettsia, which would have been good, but they found something much better and more interesting, namely these giant viruses. Genetically, these viruses have genomes greater than one megabase, obliterating once and for all the size distinction, the, the distinction in terms of genomic complexity and genome size between cellular and viral life forms. So I would, I dare say that the discovery Mm, of these viruses some about 10 years ago really sparkled a renaissance of virus research. These viruses showed some very interesting characteristics. In particular, I mentioned in passing <coughs> that viruses do not encode uh, their own um, translation system. Technically, this still stands true, even with the discovery um, of these giant viruses. But there is a big asterisk to that now, because many viruses do encode multiple intrinsic components of the translation system. In particular, such proteins that are universal of, mm, for all cellular organisms as amino acid, uh, acid, uh, acid RNA synthesis, enzymes that activate amino acids for protein synthesis. Mm, uh, so in the mini virus, in the original mini virus, Mm, there, were four, uh, there are four genes for amino acid uh, tRNA synthesis, and in the re very recently uh, discovered megavirus, there are even seven. Remarkable. Altogether, you have you need only 18 or 90. So that's that's very that's very remarkable. Mm, so uh, this finding allowed some researchers to put to include uh, the giant viruses into the so-called tree of life. And lo and behold, this is a mm, tree of life made of amino, uh, mm, made mm, or by comparison of amino acid tRNA synthetase amino acid sequences. And here is Mimivirus virus right in the center of the tree. So it has been proclaimed to be sort of a fourth domain of, in parentheses, you should say cellular life. Perhaps the only, you know, the means of a true fourth domain of uh, mm, cellular life forms that evolved by that cell degeneration scenario. Recall my, that left panel on my three panel slide. Well, I think this is patently untrue. So, mm, actually, remarkable as they are, mm, these giant viruses be belong to a much larger class of viruses, the NCOD. And they share a substantial uh, core of genes with a number of other viruses. Many of these are somewhat exotic, but some are extremely well known and important, such as the, uh, the pox viruses, in particular the smallpox virus. I don't need to explain uh, what that is. All these viruses, mm, share about 10 genes that are invariant, that are found in all of them, including some of those hallmark genes about which I have been speaking, and a more sophisticated evolutionary reconstruction using um, initially maximum parsimony and then maximum likelihood approaches uh, that we use, um, places with considerable confidence something between 45 and 50 genes into the ancestral virus of this class. And many viruses, wonderful as they are, comprise just one branch in this tree that is quite, in this tree of the NCODV, that is quite reproducible. In this case, I'm showing you tree made from the analysis of gene content, but it can be done in many mm, uh, different ways. So many viruses are actually just one branch in this, uh, in this virus class, not the fourth domain of life. The corollary of this is, of course, uh, that all these unusual, 
unusual, that is unusual for virus and genes, including the amino acid DNA synthetases and other uh, components of the translation machinery, have been acquired by these viruses at different stages of evolution from their host. We can even track down these hosts, these hosts at least on some occasions. All right. So that's, uh, uh, that's about the giant viruses, the evolution and the um, uh, fourth domain of life, or um, uh, the non-existence thereof. Uh, uh, from here, I'll go talk about uh, some newly discovered stuff. Uh, and the first subject that I want to cover here is the mobilome of the giant viruses. Now, some people may have heard the term mobilome, others may not. Um, basically, that means the entirety of um, mobile elements that are associated with a particular cellular organism. That is approximately uh, the uh, definition of the mobile. Since viruses are sort of part of that, um, or, um, or, or the, or the mobilomes of different hosts, they're not really supposed to have mobilomes of, the, of their own. This is, however, is not true. Mm. Uh, and uh, the detailed study of giant, RNA uh, giant DNA viruses actually shows, as we shall see momentarily, that they possess very complex interconnect interconnected mobilomes of their own. So, to begin with, a startling discovery, mm, mm, uh, again, uh, from Didier Raoult's lab, where, which was our first collaboration uh, with this lab, and we'll talk about much more of that, was the discovery of the so-called virophage. Virophage is a unique uh, parasite of the giant <coughs> mimivirus. Basically, if you look at this second row of AM micrographs here, you'll see within the giant virus particle, these tiny little residual particles um, of, the, of, of, of the virophage. And some um, uh, mimivirus particles are actually full of, the, of these little particles. They're, 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 they're uh, ba basically packed with, this, with the particles of this uh, parasitic virus. Moreover, um, the parasitic virus really impairs the replication of the, ho of the giant virus host, producing such grotesque forms like you see um, over there in the uh, lower left uh, corner um, you know, of this slide. So the, this uh, you know, little virus has been isolated and the ge its genome has been sequenced. It's indeed small. Uh, you know, it's uh, about three orders of magnitude smaller uh, than the host virus, only about 20 kb. But being small, it's still quite complex in a certain sense. Uh, in the following sense, basically, uh, that it has genes of very, very uh, different origin, some of which clearly come from the host giant virus, and as we now suspect, help <coughs> uh, these uh, little viruses to uh, enter the mm, intracellular virus factories and stay there. Others seem to come from other uh, NCODV, but not from these giant viruses, like this packaging ATP up, up there in the uh, upper right corner. Ah, yet others have very different origins coming from, uh, from a particular type of transposable elements and so on. Uh, basically, in the small viral genome, there is already a great mosaic of genes of very different origins. Now, this, this, the story of the virophage does not stop there. Very, very recently in a paper that is not, is not yet uh, even accepted, but I'm happy to tell you about that stuff, um, a new isolate of the virophage, so-called Sputnik II, was isolated from the contact lens fluid of a patient with an eye disease or uh, keratitis. Mm. So uh, the, vi the viral genome is quite similar um, no, to the genome of the first isolated Sputnik, but what is novel mm, is the demonstration that this Sputnik 
actually can integrate to or uh, uh, apparently random site in the host mini virus um, uh, genome, forming what are proviroses. So uh, we are starting here, see the direct interaction uh, between the components of this mobile and the <coughs> host giant virus <coughs> genome. It doesn't stop there either. <coughs> um, the study of the sequence read, in particular the rejected sequence read, or uh, that didn't assemble um, you know, with the rest of the genome or, or the giant virus, has led to the discovery of what we now call transfer virus, which is an extremely abundant novel mm, uh, genetic uh, element uh, mm, present in the uh, mm, virus particles of this new giant virus and within an infected amoeba. So, so see uh, here, uh, you see staining of, mm, or here, uh, you see mm, uh, staining of the infected amoeba with hooks to the giant virus, uh, mm, uh, to the mm, transfer virus and duppy staining, and, and you can just visually observe uh, mm, uh, that the uh, this new element transfer virus is orders of magnitude more abundant uh, than the host giant virus. What is this transfer virus? It's a small linear DNA um, of, about, of just about 7.5 kb, and we shall talk about this genome organization in a moment. Remarkably, it has been shown that the replication of the <coughs> virophage and the transfer virus very specifically depends on the species or, or the host giant virus, other giant viruses practically do not support the reproduction. In terms of the genome organization, um, you know, this element looks like this. Actually, it encodes just one large protein, uh, you know, which is the so-called superfamily helicase, something that I was actually lucky enough to describe uh, many, many years ago, um, and that uh, that is found in various kinds of genomes. We'll talk about the origin of this gene uh, a little later. And several uh, mm, small proteins, one, one of which is uh, mm, predicted to be a um, DNA binding subunit of a transposase. The other is C2H2 mm, uh, zinc thinker protein and some as well characterized. What is remarkable uh, is that two genes that I just mentioned, the transposase subunit, and the zinc finger protein are actually homologs of genes of the virophage. So we can now summarize some information about the mobiomes or about the giant mimi viruses, members of the family mimi viridae and the mobiome. <coughs> uh, the, uh, the number of giant viruses that have been identified and sequenced completely or partially is growing, we now have um, about 20, and we see these diverse components of the mobiome scattered along mm, uh, this tree uh, with the virophages and uh, mm, transpovirons, as well as group one self-splicing introns, small bacterial type bosons, and intines identifying in diverse branches, demonstrating that each of these elements is more or less common mm, among giant viruses. I'm sure that this is an incomplete picture, and a more detailed investigation will reveal uh, mm, some of these elements in other giant viruses as well. So interestingly enough, uh, mm, we also a more careful focus uh, on the uh, DNA sequence of, of these transfer virons uh, reveals exact matches between small pieces of sequence of these elements and the mimivirus. That is, apparently, there is random integration of the elements of the mobile elements uh, into the uh, fragments of the mobile element to the host virus uh, genome. So, oh, details with story, I'll oh, mm, skip it, oh, mm, but what I want to oh, mm, emphasize here is the um, exchange of DNA fragments within the mobiome of the giant viruses and with the host of mm, <coughs> viruses uh, mm, themselves. So if you take the Sputnik 2 genome, you can find pieces that match 
the host viral genome, and you can find pieces that match uh, the transport viral. So apparently, this is a complete network. There is genetic exchange between all components of this mm, uh, complex system. So the, in the next few slides, I will uh, show a variety of um, uh, phylogenetic trees. Uh, this one is about the uh, so large protein of the transport viral, uh, the helicase, that appears to be of bacterial origin that solidly clusters uh, within a group of bacterial um, superfamily one helicases. Mm, and this is uh, mm, uh, the phylogenetic tree for the DNA binding subunit of the transposis. Here we uh, mm, detect an undeniable uh, mm, clustering of the mm, transport viron protein, uh, the, the proteins from the, uh, from the, from the virophages, and they all, they clearly sit on a very long branch, so they have evolved, they have diverged far, but they do belong uh, to a particular cluster of bacterial transposases, so this is more or, more or less um, or also a bacterial origin, but not simply bacterial, but the origin from the bacterial mobulum, transfer into the mobulum of the giant viruses, Mm, so to speak. So, the story is becoming more complicated. Here is a, it's not the work that I have been involved in, but it's directly relevant to, to our whole story. Uh, now, virophage number two, so-called organic virophage, uh, that mm, uh, has been isolated from an Antarctic lake of all places, uh, and um, apparently uh, parasitizes a kind of viruses that is quite, a giant virus that is quite distant uh, from the NIMI viruses. We'll talk about the genomic content uh, in greater detail a little bit later. And now, virophage number three, the most unexpected one. Uh, uh, this one um, has been uh, isolated uh, as a parasite of, um, of the giant virus infecting the marine protein. Uh, dinoflagellate, uh, cafeteria renbergensis. It has about the same size and, stru and genomic structure other uh, mm, two um, uh, virophages. But what it showed was an unexpected and undeniable relationship with a class of eukaryotic transposals. It's a class of eukaryotic, it's, a, it's mm, the group, the largest um, mm, uh, in terms of the genome size uh, mm, or transposable element uh, detected, I think, anywhere in nature, and in particular in a great uh, variety of um, mm, uh, eukaryotic genomes. I think actually uh, mm, warm-blooded vertebrates are the only group uh, of eukaryotes where these transposable elements have not been uh, detected. They show very different abundances. Some genomes, like the um, genome of the well-known parasite Trichomonas vaginalis, are just chock full of these elements, and the genomes of these elements are very virus-like. To some extent, it has been realized even before, but now it's clear that they are not just virus-like, they are virophage-like. Uh, so some of these genomes share this block of genes, superfamily 3 helicase, um, integrase, and protein-primed DNA polymerase of the uh, B. Uh, family uh, did this ma virus paraphage, and, and on top of this, there is a couple of more generic genes, actually virus hallmark genes, the packaging and the ATP, uh, ATP and the protein and the cysteine proteins that are also uh, shared by uh, the virophages and these elements. So now, it's just a figure from, from a paper by Virgil Jurka uh, that is supposed to demonstrate briefly to you uh, the diversity of the polyton mm, transposable element genomic uh, mm, organization that, however, um, uh, mm, also includes uh, conservation of several genes, such as the aforementioned DNA polymerase, protease, and packaging TPAs. And this is a new comparison uh, that uh, mm, we put together uh, through which we probably cannot go in every detail uh, but that uh, primarily is supposed to demonstrate uh, the very complex 
network type relationship between the genes um, uh, identified in these um, diverse or um, uh, mobile selfish elements. In particular, three categories of, um, of virus-like um, mobile uh, elements. Uh, these were the viropages, the three, we have three genomes of viropages here that are, despite very similar sizes, despite very similar lifestyles, uh, actually have very diverse genomic content. We have only a few um, uh, genes in common, but importantly, these include the major capsid protein, the minor capsid protein, uh, the packaging and TPAs, uh, mm, and uh, mm, uh, the cysteine protease that is involved in virion maturation, the palintontide large transportable elements uh, from eukaryotes, are blocks of genes with at least one of these virophages, and the two hallmark genes with the other uh, virophages, and in addition, the novel mm, mobile element, the transporviron, that also shares genes with the virophages. Basically, you can do more phylogenetic analysis that leads to very interesting results. Uh, actually, what we see here is that the key genes of the three virophages, the key replication genes um, of the three virophages, the superfamily three helicases, seem to come in each case from a different source. Uh, and uh, mm, here uh, in the phylogenetic tree of the cysteine protease, do detect monophyletic virophages, but we do not detect virophage polyntone clade, and it's about the similar observation with the packaging. ATPase and the protein primed B family polymerase. And it has also been shown on top of all this that two of the virophages encode a novel type of primase domain not recognized uh, previously that related to bacteriophage or, mm, or polymerases and those of poor, certain poorly characterized bacterial bio elements. Very recently it has been shown that the virophages possess icosahedral capsids um, formed uh, apparently by a highly derived general capsid protein. And here, um, I'll, to, to uh, wrap up uh, that part of my story, I'll present an um, evolutionary um, scenario. So um, on a, uh, at a recent um, meeting on mobile uh, elements, uh, where I sort of presented this story uh, for, the, for the first time, I heard this in another talk, I heard this phrase, uh, this, this acronym, uh, B and B, which I liked very much. It was uh, presented as uh, what uh, evolutionary biologists know best how to do, fear and baloney. Um, so, so basically you, 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 drink, you drink a few, uh, and then you come up with an evolutionary scenario. Mm, so this is what I did, uh, mm, uh, and uh, mm, and the uh, evolutionary uh, the evolutionary scenario that seems most plausible to me goes from bacteriophages such as um, you know, members of the family Podoviridae, uh, PRD1 and the like that possess protein primed uh, polymerases to the virophage-like entities that of course um, infect and COBV and start taking genes from them, as well as additional genes from bacterial and archaeo plasmids and transposons, and that through the complex processes that include um, substanti substantial gene loss give rise to transpo uh, as well as acquisition of novel mm, genes, from primarily from various uh, mm, bacterial sources, give rise to transpovirons and to uh, mm, polyton type transposons in turn probably give rise to adenoviruses, uh, animal viruses, and linear DS DNA plasmids. I should note that you know, the notion of beer and baloney actually applies primarily to the uh, direction to the, of the arrows in this graph. Network relation, the network of relation, of homologous relationship between genes of all these elements is pretty well established. The speculation enters the picture when we start drawing arrows mm, instead of undirected just um, mm, uh, in the graph. What it is worth, 
I believe this is a more plausible direction of the errors, and we continue to intensely investigate the accumulated members of the part of the virus load. So what do I conclude from this, well, from this part of my story? Um, well, we have come up with the realization that is not going away, that uh, giant viruses infecting unicellular eukaryotes uh, possess their own unexpectedly complex mobiles, which includes pretty much all categories of mobile elements, including intins, self-splicing introns, posases and uh, active and non-active transposons, virophages and transpovirons, the new, the very recently uh, discovered novel kinds of mm, mobile elements. Mobile components and host viruses are interconnected by extensive stochastic exchange of genes and actually of random uh, pieces of uh, DNA. There is a clear evolutionary link between virophages and Paulinton maverick transposons of um, eukaryotes, and actually also the evolutionary link between virophages and transpovirons. I'm quite sure uh, that, uh, and, and I'm trying to make this reality in my group, uh, that uh, additional comparative genomic analysis will reveal novel type of transposons derived from, possibly derived from virophages and additional novel transpovirons. It's important to note that there are clear and direct links between viral and cellular mobiloms, both eukaryotic and uh, prokaryotic. Uh, so mm, this is a straightforward demonstration of how much viruses contribute to the evolution of, geno mm, of uh, genomes of cellular life form. Now I'll switch gears mm, in the next of my talk, which is not going to be long now. Um, I'll just tell you a few vignettes, a few stories that emphasize the mm, interesting and the exciting complexity of the uh, mm, virus uh, world. So this little story is about mm, this kind of object that you recognize as a Russian doll. I don't know whether you recognize the faces there or not, but these are the, Rus the rulers of Russia and the Soviet Union um, from early days to these days. In the, in the increasing order. Mm, uh, uh, so mm, in this case, this, uh, this metaphor applies to a specific kind of a uh, mm, bacteria uh, mm, phage genome that we discovered with our, uh, collab that, uh, with our collaborators in bacteria <coughs> phages isolated from gram-positive bacteria in Antarctica. Mm, so what this shows is an insertion of a complete phage genome into genomes of other phages. The bacterial phages are uh, typical tailed phages that walk with. But the genomes are nowhere near typical. They mm, actually consist, like you see in the middle part of this slide, of, mm, of juxtaposed genomes of mm, different uh, mm, uh, bacteri bacteria uh, mm, phages, each of which is found uh, in the isolated form as a distinct prophage in genomes of um, uh, but, uh, various uh, species of bottles. Mm. Uh, so uh, what, what, what happens here is really a formation of chimeric uh, mm, phage genomes. They are a genome of uh, mm, one phage, which is defective, which only <coughs> encodes structural components, nothing necessary for replication, is inserted into the genome of another phage that carries everything required for the genome. Replication apparently most likely displacing the native structural uh, components and resulting in this Russian doll arrangement. The next little story that I want to tell you is actually a story in which I have not been uh, directly involved, it's, but it's coming out from very hopefully today or tomorrow in this journal Biology Direct. Uh, mm, uh, which, which is my favorite journal, uh, mm, uh, and mm, is, I think, is, a, is, I think, a very demonstrative of what metagenomics allows you, um, allows us now to discover in the um, virus uh, world. Um, so this is, uh, this is about a novel virus uh, that has been 
discovered by the metagenomic study of a thermal lake um, um, at um, Russian Volcanic Park in um, uh, Northern uh, California. So, um, first glance, there is nothing super unusual um, in this uh, genome because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a small uh, um, uh, circular genome uh, of about 4 KB uh, um, uh, that uh, contains a, um, a typical replicase protein uh, which basically is a um, rolling circle replication <coughs> initiation and the nucleus. The rest of the, G or, or the proteins uh, that are encoded in this genome are very unexpected. Namely, what we find here is a hybrid of what, uh, um, what are known as typical genomes of um, RNA and DNA uh, um, virus. Um, the, um, uh, the replicates, the uh, um, initiation and the nucleus show a clear relationship with the so-called circoviruses over there on the right, which is single which is a typical single-stranded um, uh, DNA viruses, whereas, completely unexpectedly, capsid protein shows very strong relationship with the capsid proteins of thrombus viruses that infect plant and algae. So the scenario here would be, I imagine, uh, that at some point in evolution, we really don't know when, uh, there was a co-infection of a unicellular alga with an RNA virus and a DNA, a single-stranded DNA virus, and uh, this uh, hybrid has, uh, has emerged uh, uh, through uh, uh, a recommend, uh, rather complex recombination process uh, that also involves a um, uh, reverse um, uh, transcription uh, step. So this really represents the new pace of virology. Um, this is a genome that has been uh, mm, discovered by metagenomic analysis, uh, and uh, all kinds of precautions have been taken to show that this is not a chimeric clone, that this is really present, is really a molecule that is present in that <coughs> particular thermal lake, but this is as far as you can go with these approaches. We don't know the exact host. We can have perhaps reasonable guesses, uh, but there is no direct information on the host. There is no direct information on the virus particle. Again, we have a good guess of what it's going to look like. There is, there is no information about the ecology of this virus beyond the isolation from a thermal lake, and so on and so forth. So this is what metagenomic does. The genome is, is isolated, in this case apparently a complete genome of a, a small virus. The rest remains to be done. And in the last story that I'm going to tell today, uh, I'm going to, to, um, to discuss uh, a very, very unexpected discovery, also may, made by uh, metagenomics, um, uh, in which I uh, had a good luck to be involved. Um, uh, and this is gentleman <coughs> over there, is Mark Young from Montana uh, State University, who actually did this uh, metagenomic um, analysis of, on the sequences isolated from this and similar po uh, mm, hot pools. Um, mm, these are extremely hot pools. This is uh, about 90 degrees, and this, the temperature is very uniform uh, through uh, mm, out the pool in Yellowstone Park, and here they are um, mm, uh, discussing with him uh, the isolation of these agents. Mm, so uh, mm, uh, what, what, has, what has been uh, done, basically, was, was a focused hunt uh, for potential RNA viruses in these uh, metagenomes. So what you have to keep in mind is um, uh, that these environments, as I said, extremely uh, are uh, strongly dominated by archaea. Simply put, there are only, only archaeal cells that are isolated from these pools uh, and, the, uh, and the species diversity of the archaea is very small. Basically, you can only isolate um, a few um, species of um, sulfurobos uh, from, from, the, from, this, from these pools along with the um, DNA viruses. Here, however, Mark made the bold effort to remove all DNA and do the RNA metagenomics. 
Fortunately, it has been successful, mm, uh, and a variety of contexts or, mm, or from the first fraction of this mm, isolated from this pool, uh, a variety of RNA contexts have been detected. The largest one being a uh, little less than 6 kb, and encoding, lo and behold, um, mm, uh, genes for predicted RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and code protein or, mm, of um, RNA viruses. Uh, so, uh, this, this, I dare say it now, putative archaeo RNA virus encodes, uh, there were actually a couple of contexts like this, so I say putative archaeo RNA viruses encode a very typical positive strand RNA virus, RNA dependent RNA polymerase that is not closely related to any known family of viruses, but that retains all the characteristic conserved amino acid motifs of, of these enzymes and or by homology modeling can be, can be folded in a very similar structure. And that in the phylogenetic tree, if you look at this at branch, sits right in the middle without significant affinity with any known uh, group of positive strand RNA viruses, which is compatible at least with the ancestral nature of this uh, mm, uh, genome. Or on top of this, this putative archaeo RNA virus encode a capsid protein that is distantly related to capsid proteins of a particular family of very simple eukaryotic positive strand RNA viruses and other viruses, and even is predicted to possess a proteolytic activity like the capsid, like the nodal virus capsid proteins. So, we are not yet confident oh, that this is an archaeovirus. I think this, this is really an extraordinary claim that requires an extraordinary, that requires extraordinary evidence. Not all of that extraordinary evidence has been collected, but assuming that given this is archaeo-native community, this has been isolated repeatedly, and so on and so forth. So I feel comfortable enough to hypothetically assume um, this, uh, that this is an archaeo virus. What does it tell us uh, about virus evolution? Something very interesting, I think. Years ago or so, oh, my colleagues and I did a very, very detailed evolutionary study of the oh, picornal-like viral superfamily that actually was stimulated by mm, the discovery, by the metagenomic discovery on some unusual oh, members oh, of this uh, superfamily. These are very, very simple viruses of about 7 kb, give or take, um, 7 kb that contain several signature hallmark genes. And they, we managed to paste the native origin of, of these hallmark genes from uh, different sources. Apparently, uh, from the um, sources that include uh, bacterial retrotranscribing elements, bacterial um, uh, and bacterial um, genes, bacterial genes themselves, and probably also bacteriophages. Now, however, and, 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 what, and, and, and the scenario with which we came up was sort of a biological Big Bang scenario, according to which the assembly of these viral genomes happened concomitantly of, you know, with eukaryogenesis, the origin of eukaryotic cells, which makes a lot of sense because these viruses are, mm, in fact, extremely broad range of uh, eukaryotes, and then was followed by the rapid divergence uh, mm, of uh, different families of these viruses. Uh, much of this very well can be true, but the finding of this putative ancestral archaeovirus really brings a new dimension to this understanding by showing uh, that the arrangement, that the combinations of genes, arrangements of genes, uh, typical of these viruses, actually could have come up already in the prokaryotic world, in particular in the archaea, uh, and might have been right there uh, in the host of the mito in the original host of the mitochondrial endosymbiont. So, I think I'm, I told you pretty much what I wanted to tell you, and just want to make some conclusions. There are many, but I think the important one is that metagenomics really complementing 
the more traditional comparative genomic is changing the way our virology is done. Increasingly, it so happens, genome comes before uh, the virus. Here, of course, um, comparison of, ge uh, of genomic sequences, comparison of protein sequences, comparison of protein structures becomes uh, um, of uh, even greater importance than in other types of study because this is pretty much your, the only tool that you immediately have in your disposal. So there is a huge challenge, of course, of isolating viruses infecting unknown hosts and buttressing these metagenomic discoveries by more um, traditional uh, virology. But there is no doubt already, I think, even from the, these few stories that I showed you, that there is a lot of unexpected, exciting stuff out there. Above all, unexpected <coughs> chimeras, but also completely novel viruses and mobile elements. And I think it's, it is beyond doubt the contribution of diverse viruses to the evolution of eukaryotic <coughs> genomes is even greater than ever previously recognized. So we have a long way to go to understand these things. It's, it's, it's a real marathon distance, but I think we can make it. I want to um, uh, acknowledge people uh, who have been uh, involved um, in this work, or uh, my co-conspirators in the formulation of the virus without concepts, Valerian Dolly and Tanya Sinkevich, Didier Old uh, uh, and his very large group, I couldn't um, uh, the names on this slide at uh, Université Mediterranean at Marseille, uh, with, which we study, uh, with whom we study uh, giant viruses and their mobilome, Kira Makarova um, uh, from the uh, NCBI, who is a true expert in sequence analysis and have been in that capacity involved in many of these studies. Natalia Yutin, a postdoc in my group, um, much of whose work has been dedicated uh, to the study um, of the giant uh, viruses, uh, Aravind and Lux, with whom we uh, identified um, a variety of protein families uh, and um, described for the first time the evolution of the NCLDV. Michael Taldiansky of Scotland, with whom we studied the dog bacteriophages. These are not all collaborators, but these are those that make the greatest contribution. And of course, I want to um, uh, thank you, uh, you know, all for coming here and for your attention on this afternoon of Friday the 13th. Thank you very much. <laughs> By way of TGIF, I am very happy to answer any questions you might have. At least try. Not many? The, the size of these uh, mimi viruses you sequence the genome. Is this due to expansion of redundancy to shield itself from these expansive elements integrating itself within the genome? And why is it so big? Oh, I'm, very, I'm very sorry. I'm not sure. I, oh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm hearing you right. Oh, be, beyond mimi viruses, then what? The, the, uh -huh. the size of the mimi virus is this due to expansion of redundancy to protect itself versus these viral transposable elements? Or why, why is it so big? Why is it 1.2 megabases of, of a virus? Oh, no. Uh, if, if I got you right, you know, uh, mm, there's always uh, some kind of arms race uh, between, between hosts and parasites, in particular viruses. So what do, the, do these viruses have mm, to protect themselves against these parasites, these genomic parasites? Great question. We don't really know. Uh, this, is, this is very new, and molecular biology is very much behind. But looking at the content of the mm, uh, giant virus genome, mm, we, can, we, we can develop some ideas. In particular, um, uh, they mm, encode a variety of nucleases, mm, and uh, specifically restriction type and the nucleases, the functions of which are not known, but one of which, or the main of which, uh, mm, is very likely to uh, be mm, defense mm, uh, against uh, mm, uh, these, these uh, elements. Mm. 
and then there and then there may be there be, there well may be more complicated paths of defense that are also related to signaling in the host. So, for instance, they encode a variety of components of the ubiquitin system. We, again, we don't really know what they do. In principle, they could attack uh, you know, these parasites and target some of them uh, for uh, degradation. So there are certainly candidates in the genomes. Uh, you, can, you can find many things in the uh, genomes of these giant viruses, in particular candidates for uh, defense systems. But the experimental investigation is unfortunately lagging far behind here. Given your work on these archaeal viruses, I'm just wondering if you have also given any thought to the role that uh, viruses or viral elements may have played in the origin of the chimeric uh, eukaryotic cell. Again, that is a very so so the question uh, mm, then is what could have been the role of viruses in the origin of the eukaryotic cell, which I, uh, I strongly believe, I have, to, I have to say a word about the origin of the eukaryotic cells. Um, what, what I strongly believe is that um, you know, the endosymbiotic um, or process um, actually has been the beginning of the trigger of the eukaryogenesis. I think this is, this is not the time to recapit uh, recapitulate the evidence of this, but, but there is really uh, quite a bit. Accordingly, um, the role of viruses in this process. There is very significant contributions very clearly. Um, um, just, just to give you one example, think about telomerase. Um, uh, the key enzyme, the, for which, you know, the Nobel Prize have been, have been given a couple of years ago, um, uh, which is essential uh, for the applications of the ends of the mm, or linear chromosomes in all your curves. Where does it come from? That clearly comes uh, from uh, mm, uh, prokaryotic retrotranscribing elements. Most likely, mm, not, not quite viruses, but definitely virus-like elements. Then, uh, mm, uh, think about, uh, most likely bacteria. Uh, think about, some, uh, about something that is even more widespread in eukaryotic, is the intron. Mm, uh, there, um, where do the introns come from? Well, it's, uh, it's less clear, uh, it may be considered less obvious and less clear, it's the, is less obvious um, than it is in the case of telomerase, but by now also clear. They come uh, from group two self-splicing introns that actually um, are found in a variety of prokaryotes, primarily bacteria, uh, and that uh, themselves actually are retrotranscribing elements. At the same time, they are ribosomes that, um, cleave, uh, that, that function as self, um, self-excising intron. They, they end interact and they excise themselves um, from the uh, primary transcript. So this is the origin of eukaryotic introns as well um, as the SNO RNA, which are the active moieties um, of the uh, um, splices of um, actually, the reconstruction of genomic evolution of eukaryotes shows uh, that uh, the massive intron invasion is very early in the evolution of eukaryotes. And in a more speculative um, manner of thinking, uh, might have been even uh, one of the triggers of um, eukaryogenesis, uh, uh, such as the formation of the nucleus. Uh, so, to cut the long thing, I could speak about this for quite a while, uh, and, and, and here I try to show you tentative, but I think tantalizing evidence of the origin of the um, whole world of eukaryotic RNA viruses um, uh, from archaeal viruses. Um, but to cut a long thing short, uh, the contributions are very large of viruses and uh, virus-like elements. Without them, there simply would have been no eukaryotes. here. 
Yeah, if there are no questions, so we will have a group picture outside. Yeah, on the in the atrium. Yeah. So again, once thank you.